I am Chris Johnstone. I'm the Senior Advisor and Japan Chair here at CSIS. Uh, and on behalf of CSIS and the Japan Institute for International Affairs, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 29th, the 29th annual U.S.-Japan Security Seminar. For nearly 30 years, the U.S.-Japan Security Seminar has played an important role in promoting dialogue between our two nations aimed at strengthening uh, the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance. Yesterday, uh, a group of experts from both countries met privately and in person after two years of doing this online uh, to exchange views on a range of issues on the Alliance agenda. And the purpose of this event is to um, uh, tease out, touch on some of the themes that we discussed yesterday with all of you. It has been a truly extraordinary year since the last time we met uh, in the Alliance. In December, Japan issued uh, three strategic documents, the new national security strategy, a new national defense strategy, setting out plans for unprecedented increases in defense spending uh, and investments in new capabilities. The U.S.-Japan 2 plus 2 meeting that followed in January uh, of this year produced agreement on adjustments to U.S. force posture uh, and other ways to deepen U.S.-Japan alliance cooperation, including standing up a new Marine littoral regiment, um, uh, expanding the bilateral exercise program and advancing our technology cooperation on advanced capabilities. And last July, the two governments launched a new economic 2 plus 2, the Economic Policy Consultative Committee to better align policies on issues such as supply chain resilience, export controls, uh, and regional economic engagement. And I can't remember, as I think about all of these accomplishments over the last year, a time when our relationship has been closer and when we were more closely aligned across a, across a whole range of issues. But there is still certainly a lot of work to be done in the Alliance to implement uh, and move forward on our respective strategies and to ensure that we remain aligned on the issues of the day. To quote uh, or evoke, I should say, Ambassador Kato Ryozo, uh, the flowers are blooming here on an early spring day, but there is still plenty of work to be done in the Alliance garden. Um, there's still many issues that could tug us, I think, in different directions, whether it's thinking about the future of U.S.-Japan Alliance Command and Control or the balance between interdependence and technology competition with China. Um, there's a lot, a lot to discuss and to manage um, in, the, in the days and years ahead. Um, we'll get into a little bit of this on stage with some of our um, a key uh, participants in the meeting yesterday, but first I'd like to start with a video greeting uh, from Foreign Minister Hayashi Yoshimasa, which we presented at the beginning of the seminar yesterday as well, and I think it will set the stage nicely for our, for our discussion. This greeting is in English, uh, and I'll ask our team to, uh, to start the video now, and then we'll assemble on stage. So thank you. Dear friends and colleagues, I would like to extend my heartfelt congratulations to CSIS and JAYA for co-hosting the 29th Japan-U.S. Security Seminar. I also congratulate you for finally being able to meet in person for the first time in the last three years. This seminar continues to be a valuable platform where both Japan and the United States bring together their wisdom and have sincere discussions on the evolving security environment. Needless to say, such discussions now bear glowing importance in light of the critical role that the Japan-U.S. alliance should play in the current circumstances. At the outset, I would like to emphasize that it couldn't be more timely to organize this seminar at this juncture. It comes just after the recent series of pivotal events for our alliance, namely the release of our two countries' respective strategic documents last year, and the Japan-U.S. summit meeting, as well as the 2 plus 2 meeting, both held this past January. At the 2 plus 2 meeting, I had a great opportunity to have a flank discussion with Secretary of State Blinken, Secretary of Defense Austin, and Minister of Defense Hamada. We agreed to make further efforts to strengthen the deterrence and response capabilities of our alliance based on the new strategies 
in increasingly severe security environment that we face today. At the 2 plus 2, we orchestrated a vision of a modernized alliance postured to prevail in a new era of strategic competition. The immediate challenge for a true government is to turn this vision into reality with a sense of urgency. I myself will make every effort to that end, together with my counterparts in the U.S. government and a wide range of partners for our alliance. I will not repeat in detail what we said in this vision, which I suppose you are already familiar with. That said, as my contribution to this seminar, let me share with you the following three takeaways from the meeting. I believe they are quite fitting to the main agenda items of this seminar. Firstly, the vision, priorities, and goals of our two countries as exemplified in our strategic documents have never reached the level of convergence as we see today. This alignment forms a solid foundation for our efforts to constantly modernize the alliance in order to address the ever-changing security environment. Japan and the United States are firmly aligned as well in a strategic picture of the region. Among them, we concur that China's foreign policy-based actions aimed at reshaping the international order for its own benefit are of serious concern to the alliance and the entire international community and pose the greatest strategic challenge in the Indo-Pacific region and beyond. Secondly, the 2 plus 2 meeting was an opportunity to lay out our efforts to strengthen the deterrence and response capabilities of our alliance. For its part, Japan made a historic decision to fundamentally reinforce its defense capabilities, including counter-strike capabilities, through doubling its defense budget in five years. Such reinforcement of Japan's defense capabilities will not only help ensure the defense of Japan, but also lead to more effective empl employment of U.S. capabilities and thereby further strengthen the deterrence and response capabilities of the Alliance. The United States expressed its strong support for these efforts by Japan when Prime Minister Kishida and I visited Washington, D.C. in January, which sent a very strong and positive message for the Alliance. At the same time, Japan welcomes that the United States restated its unwavering commitment to the defense of Japan using its full range of capabilities, including nuclear. The United States also expressed its determination to optimize its force posture in the Indo-Pacific, including by recently announced deployment in Okinawa of the Marine Littoral Regiment, which we welcome. Furthermore, given the growing importance of outer space to peace, security, and prosperity, we declared that the attacks in outer space could lead to the invocation of Article 5 of the Japan-U.S. Security Treaty. This demonstrates just one example of the Alliance's constant efforts to stay ahead of the curve in the current security environment across new domains. Last but not least, we also reaffirmed the importance for both Japan's self-defense forces and the U.S. forces to conduct activities with utmost consideration to impacts on local communities while communicating with them about the importance of alliance activities. This seminar is something that I have a special personal attachment to since I had the opportunity to personally participate in 2019. This network of Japanese and U.S. experts, which this seminar has long helped to grow, has played a key role for the deepening of the U.S.-Japan alliance, as well as shaping international public opinion on security challenges in the Indo-Pacific. 
I would like to conclude my message with my best wishes for the success of this seminar. Thank you for your attention. Again, to Foreign Minister Hayashi for that generous message uh, to get us started here today. It's now my pleasure to introduce our very distinguished panel. Um, first, uh, I think known to pretty much all of you, Ambassador Sasai Kinichiro, President of the Japan International, uh, Institute for International Affairs, uh, and of course, former Ambassador to, to the United States. Welcome, Ambassador. Yeah. Uh, then we have uh, Dr. Maria Solis. Senior Fellow and Director of the Center for Northeast Asia Policy Studies and the Philip Knight Chair in Japan Studies at the Brookings Institution. Welcome, Maria. And Dr. Ayumi Teraoka, uh, um, the America in the World Consortium Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of Texas at Austin, and perhaps most importantly, a former Japan Chair intern uh, in the past. So really great pleasure to have all of, all of you here. We'll have a little informal discussion on the stage and then we'll open up to, to, to questions. Um, but let me first, Ambassador Sasai, really start with the news of the day, if I could. Of course. Um, we really have, I think, over the last 24, 48 hours, a tale of two visits. We have Xi Jinping uh, in Moscow um, in, uh, in contravention of world opinion, uh, offering uh, political support to President Putin and then we've had Prime Minister Kishida in India, and then overnight in Ukraine. Uh, and apparently his, his visit has already included a stop in Bucha. Quite a contrast. I wonder any reactions you, you have to this. Well, thank you, Chris, first of all. I thought that you were going to first talk about Japan's winning over Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> but anyway, that was a very healthy competition. But if you look around the world, it's not necessarily always uh, healthy competitions, uh, especially geopolitical challenges all around us. But um, this news of Prime Minister going to uh, Ukraine is a good one, of course. And uh, it's not a surprise. This has been on agenda for some, some time, I would say. So not simply because Japan is chairing uh, G7 this year. Of course, it is necessary for the Prime Minister to go and give a support uh, to Ukraine winning this war. I think the important part of this exercise to continue to support Ukraine to win the war over Russia. The question is how we would do it. I think that's where countries like Japan and the United States could step up its joint effort together with European and other Western allies and friends to make sure that uh, our assistance, including militarily, and uh, not only political and military, economic, and all this humanitarian aid will be shaping up. So that uh, Putin might be feeling that uh, there is a more strong, better coordinated Western sustainability uh, and to, to, to cope with the situation. Putin might think that uh, this is a war against Russia, not necessarily between uh, Russia and Ukraine. But still, I think we have uh, some balance to what we will do in the future, <coughs> especially when it comes to our military posture and, and support to Ukraine. But I think the important part of this exercise, Prime Minister visit, is first to give a political blessing. We are continue to be behind Ukraine and continue to support Ukraine to win the war. Yeah, it's really, a, I think, a powerful reminder of the degree to which Japan, but other countries in Asia, too, have showed up mm -hmm. in Europe on behalf of, of Ukraine, literally showed up, yeah. right? Yeah. So. yeah, and especially, you know, the countries uh, in Asia, uh, ASEAN, many of them are taking a uh, rather neutral stance. But a uh, country like, uh, you know, Singapore is uh, more proactive in supporting uh, Ukraine's position on the war. And so I think there are some differences. What is important is to get all these uh, neutral uh, countries, especially in the global south, uh, to be more favorable to the West, not necessarily abandoning their traditional neutral positions. Yeah. 
Well, let's turn to, uh, to the, some of the discussions that we had yesterday. And again, Ambassador, I'll invite you to start and then we'll go across our panel. Um, I just wonder if you could share your, your broad views on the state of the alliance uh, and how we should be thinking about priorities uh, as we implement our respective national security strategies. The, um, the foreign minister noted the convergence um, of, our, of our strategies. I wonder um, if you could share some thoughts on how we sustain that convergence going forward. Ambassador Elsa. Oh, also, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Asking well, I'll, yeah, 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 yeah. And then we'll yeah. then we'll work our way through. Yeah. You, so let me start you, with you. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 So uh, the state of the alliance and the uh, and <laughs> the state of the alliance and then um, uh, uh, priorities for implementing our respective yeah. uh, national okay. security right. strategies. Uh, the state of our alliance <laughs> is great, as you know, right? and uh, not simply because the prime minister and the foreign minister had meetings and uh, agreed on the basic goals uh, we, are, we are sharing. But more the fact that I think the alliance is updated uh, to the increasing challenge around us. Oh, sorry. Oh, this is not working well? All right. And, uh, <clears throat> and the fact that uh, Japan has uh, made a decision uh, to, uh, uh, to do what we need to do, not necessarily what we can do. I think that's the fundamental uh, departure from the past uh, complacent policy, that uh, the things that we cannot do, we don't pursue. But I think in terms of the environment in which we operate, I think uh, the, uh, we need to do. And for that, as the foreign minister mentioned, uh, the, the fact that uh, we are drastically changing changing the security positions uh, uh, of our policy is more converged uh, with the United States vision. So the alliance agenda is first, we need to update and deepen the, all this uh, coordination, including uh, issue like uh, uh, joint uh, command and control. There was much debate yesterday how it should be uh, looking like, including the possible, uh, I would say, set up of a U.S. Uh, command and control system in Japan on top of what's, uh, what's already th there in the, in, in the Pacific and also extended deterrence. I mean, that's increasingly important against the background that uh, we are not successful uh, in, in stopping North Korean uh, nuclear and missile ambitions uh, for over the two decades. And uh, there is no uh, immediate perspective that uh, we would open up the negotiation with North Korea. So they, they will continue to build up uh, their arsenal. And so uh, in doing that, I, I think we need to update and our own joint deterrence, uh, including nuclear, and especially in the context of uh, having a South Korean you know, allocate government with us. I think that was good news, you know it, right? That was a good decision taking place uh, uh, two weeks ago that uh, uh, they were ready to uh, uh, advance the relationship and not simply, uh, you know, having, keeping in mind the legacy of the history, but moving ahead into the future and try to work out the relationship better. And uh, that will be the basis for the three trilateral security corporations uh, to be developed. And other issues, I think uh, the, uh, the, the what we could do jointly uh, together uh, to, 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 to make the system working better like quads and uh, in the Pacific uh, framework. Uh, you know, the prime minister announced a, a good message in India when he visited India that uh, we are undertaking more specific uh, formula of assistance to the developing nations in the region and on top of the, uh, uh, the uh, military and even defense uh, support to this country required, especially on the maritime and the space domain this time. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Mireya, uh, uh, the issues related to economic security were a big theme yesterday. I wonder what you took from that uh, discussion that you'd like to share with us today. Um, thank you very much, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Um, it was truly a pleasure to participate in uh, yesterday's discussion. So much was shared and I learned a lot and then an opportunity today to reflect with all of you. And uh, some thoughts on economic security. I would start by saying, first of all, that it's really remarkable 
what a central role this agenda now plays in the U.S.-Japan alliance. And it's remarkable because this has happened very quickly, just a few years back. In the pre-pandemic days, perhaps we would not be putting so much attention to this topic. And now it has become so pervasive. And there's so much energy and so much happening that sometimes it's hard to capture or fully understand how much um, is already taking place. So I'll start with the good news that comes from this, but also then move on to highlight some of the challenges. I think that the first positive message that we should take from these developments is that we really have a very nimble partnership between the United States and Japan that can move on quickly to take on these very uh, pressing policy issues. So an alliance that evolves is certainly good news because it means that we're better prepared for what's coming uh, next. Second, I think that this economic security agenda is very important uh, between the United States and Japan because we're talking about two countries that have a lot to put on the table. They are technological leaders. And that means that whatever they do, singly or together, will make a difference in this new agenda of economic security. Third, I think it's also important related to this that we're seeing a very fast pace of policy innovation, both in the United States and Japan. So there's a new toolkit that's being developed right in front of our eyes. Um, and here you have the United States and Japan, I think, acting as uh, really um, uh, setting the pace or innovating. And Japan in particular, I would say, was really striking to see, for example, the appointment of an economic security minister or the adoption of a very comprehensive bill on economic security. And I think that makes Japan a front runner in this agenda. And the United States, you know, so much is happening. Uh, we just have to be judicious with what we do with it, and I'll uh, get to that in a moment. But it's very true that the United States now has fully embarked, uh, embraced the notion of economic statecraft. And you see this from a Republican to a Democratic administration, this concept that economic security is national security. That now has become ingrained in the way in which the United States think of its role in world affairs, the way in which uh, the United States uh, drafts its own um, foreign policy. So, you know, this is still positive. Another very positive element is that there is very strong alignment, I would say, between the United States and Japan in the diagnosis of what is the problem set. What are the drivers? Why do we should care about the fusion of economics and national security? There's an awareness about the technological revolution and the implications of it. So there's a, a lot of parallel discussion in both countries on certain uh, technologies, platform technologies, families of technologies that will have tremendous implications for economic competitiveness, for military readiness. There's also, I think, a shared diagnosis of some of the problems that Chinese state capitalism presents for liberal democracies. And therefore, the fact that in China we see a drive for uh, indigenization in the high-tech sector, that some of the technology practices of China uh, are, are very questionable and therefore it's important to protect against technological uh, leakage. And of course, growing concern about economic coercion and that how undermines the, the rules-based uh, order. And we're also seeing innovation in terms of the platforms that the Alliance is developing to tackle these issues. So uh, with uh, uh, Prime Minister Suga and uh, President Biden, you had the launch of the core partnership, uh, competitiveness and resilience. And later on, under Prime Minister Kishida and President Biden, you have this uh, very important development that you alluded to, Chris, this economic two plus two. So there's a lot happening for them, uh, by and large, very positive. But there are buts here, and they're very major. And I think that uh, we should, uh, you know, this is moving so fast that I sometimes wonder if we are not being cautious enough. And I, this is a note of caution, uh, if you will. So what are the areas where I think that there are gaps uh, uh, between the two countries or where we better be very careful with what we do? Uh, first of all, I would say that there is a very significant gap in the balance, and again, Chris, you alluded to this, that each country is striking in terms of economic interdependence and uh, risk minimization or defensive economic measures. So um, the United States does not have big game when it comes to the economic connectivity agenda. Uh, I can talk about the Indo-Pacific economic framework in the questions, but I'm really uh, worried that it might not amount to much long-lasting framework for the region. And in contrast, Prime Minister Kishida was just yesterday uh, um, uh, 
uh, in India, launching the new phase of the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy with economic connectivity at the heart of this. So that's one main difference. Another main difference, I would say, is in how the United States and Japan are thinking about balancing the different equities of their relationship with China. And even though uh, there's a lot of harsh rhetoric here, of course, that the trade relation with China remains very robust, but increasingly you hear more and more vo voices in the United States using a zero-sum frame to describe competition with China. And I don't think you find the same uh, in Japan. There's still more of a balancing act. Certainly, much more skepticism about whole-scale decoupling uh, from China. Now, uh, let me just conclude, and I know I've been going on for a while, but Chris, if I may, three main issues directly related to the economic security agenda, where I think it's important for both allies to uh, talk a lot, uh, consult with each other intensely, and make sure we are on the same page and we, end up, we do not end up creating gaps with one another. First issue, industrial policy. This is an era where we see a renaissance of a desire of the state to uh, be very strategic, invest uh, resources, provide subsidies, attract the leading edge firms to come and produce in the homeland to try to uh, address some of these uh, vulnerabilities. And there are two issues uh, and that come from this. One is that everybody is doing it, and second, that the United States does it or wants to do it differently. Let me unpack this. When I say everybody is doing it, I literally mean this. It's not just China now. It's the United States with the uh, Chips and Science Act. It's Japan with its semiconductor strategy. It's the Korean government also providing funds, the Taiwanese uh, government, the Europeans. Right? So there is indeed a risk of a subsidy war among like-minded countries. The competition is not just going to be us vis-a-vis -vis China. It is going to be amongst all of these other countries that we think of as partners and allies. So that's one very important discipline on the uh, award of subsidies, very important. But secondly, the U.S. has highlighted a different take on industrial policy that also came through in the Science and uh, Chips and Science Act. And that is, for example, that the U.S. is going to attach strings so that firms that receive those subsidies cannot expand their activities in China. And that also is going to create some uh, difficulties, adjustments for uh, companies, Japanese companies, Korean companies, American companies, on whether they take on those subsidies or not, because how that affects their existing operations or future operations in China. Second, another tension is between onshoring and friendshoring. And I think that here the Inflation Reduction Act brought this to the surface. And here, for example, there are many strings attached if you are going to receive, if you're a, a, a company that produces cars and you're going to receive these tax credits. One of those requirements is going to be to reduce your supply, your procurement of critical materials from, uh, critical minerals from China. And there's going to be a growing expectation that those minerals are either sourced or recycled in the United States or an FTA, free trade agreement partner. The wrinkle here for Japan is that because the United States withdrew from the TPP, the Un Japan does not have a comprehensive FTA, and the guidance from the Treasury uh, Department has been that the European Union and Japan and other countries may need to negotiate narrow trade agreements on critical minerals. So again, we're moving the post, if you will, and now this creates another a layer for uh, Japanese companies to be able to enjoy parity uh, uh, same treatment with other companies. And finally, and sorry for going so long, export controls. And here, uh, there's so much happening and this is critical because in the past few months, we've seen the United States redefine how uh, they, the administration thinks about the nature of competition with China. And now it's about making sure that China does not have access to the highest levels of, you know, for example, uh, uh, the most advanced chips. And the United States then began very quickly to implement that with the October 7th export control decision. And it was a big gamble because there's an extraterritorial element to that that our allies do not like. But also there was a need to then bring on board uh, the Japanese and the Netherlands so that they would not undermine these export controls. So again, this creates friction. This creates a need to coordinate with one another. My last point on the uh, um, breakthrough that Ambassador Sasai mentioned the U.S., Japan, uh, the, the Japan-South Korea rapprochement, 
That is very uh, welcome news, and I think what's important now is to go further, and uh, now that the main dispute seems to be uh, addressed and uh, uh, Japan is going to eliminate some of these curbs or, or restrictions on the export of advanced chemicals and South Korea withdrew its WTO case, this is, not, this is good, but now it should provide uh, the, the opportunity for the United States, Japan, South Korea, and like-minded countries to go further and develop a plurilateral export control regime. So this is just the beginning coming out from that breakthrough. Thank you. Really excellent, Maria. I'm, I, you know, as, as, just as you frame this, this notion of the balance between interdependence and risk mitigation, I, I really see this as an emerging central issue mm -hmm. in our relationship. And I hear a lot of contrasting views in Japan, particularly among the in the business community, uh, concern about how far this goes and how we stay on the same page. So very, very well laid out, I thought. Um, Ayumi, let me now turn to you. We had a lot of discussion yesterday about really the acceleration, if you will, of minilateralism in the region. The, uh, the, the deepening ties, not just among the United States and its allies, but among our allies themselves. When you think about Japan's relationship with Australia, Japan's the progress in the relationship with the ROK, with the Philippines of late. Want to welcome your thoughts on um, the role of these relationships in um, reinforcing deterrence and, and stability in the region and where you see particular priorities and opportunities. Thank you so much. Uh, I, it's, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I used to run mics in these events and I was very good at it. I was a good mic runner. Uh, but uh, so, through looking uh, sitting in uh, at the seminar, I learned quite a lot. And as Chris noted, uh, there has been a lot that has happened since last year. And when it comes to bolstering deterrence, there's a couple of components. One is what Japan can do on its own, and the other is bilateral cooperation between U.S. and Japan, but also other minilaterals mean, and other uh, cooperation with other partners. Uh, but I think that what Japan did with the defense strategy papers and all these defense investment is really to signal to uh, potential adversaries that Japan is really serious in pursuing this direction of balancing. Um, and I think it's quite notable uh, that Japan is doing this investment despite its financial constraints, despite the self-imposed legal constraints, and despite the fact that that there was an assassination of long-term long time leader, Abe Shinzo, last year, but still there is resistance, re resilience in this strategy and pursuing this strategy going forward, and that, that's a really important signaling device. Um, and, but at the same time, we all know that acquiring these technologies and uh, capabilities um, does not, is not an end in, 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 a, in and of itself. So we will have to be able to have an organizational structure to operate these new capabilities together with the United States, possibly with other like-minded countries in the region. Uh, and that would require a lot of exercises and training. Um, and I think the challenge going forward is to do that with also bringing the Japanese domestic opinion, the public together with the direction that the, the security needs need Japan to take. Um, so. I think that will be an uh, important perspective. 94% of Japanese think the relationship with the U.S. is important, not just for its own bilateral relationship or two countries, but for the entire region. But I think, and the majority of people also su support the defense budget increase. It's just that they are not comfortable when the leadership just goes too fast on these decisions. I think there has to be a careful leadership and persuasion by the leaders that these efforts are meaningful and at every step of the way. Um, networking with allies is a really shared component of strategy between U.S. and Japan. Um, and I think that this is also a signaling device to Beijing and others that there will be uh, consequences or potential global backlash if they were to engage in any military actions, for example, in Taiwan. So this, is, this, this show of unity in peacetime is difficult to achieve, but I think it's really meaningful. Um, against um, any av potential adversaries. I think a lot of ties have developed over time. Asia has been sort of home for a lot of multilateral frameworks uh, for decades now, but over time it has also built in more European allies and 
partnerships in Asia. I think since the war in Ukraine, there has been a lot more uh, acceleration of efforts of tie, uh, building ties between NATO and Japan. Um, and I think Japanese and Asian partners are also looking at war in Ukraine as some, some event that we can learn lessons from. So there is a lot of cross-theater uh, learning process that's happening. That's really important. Uh, there are multilateral frameworks, Quad G7, G20, AUKUS, ASEAN, uh, and trilaterals that have been more advanced, like US, Japan, ROK, US, Japan, and Australia, uh, with different agreements. Foreign Minister Hayashi is visit, has just visited uh, Pacific Islands, and for example, including Cook Islands, that no uh, former prime, uh, mini, foreign minister has ever visited. So Japan's presence in Pacific Islands is also increasing. And, and some partnership might be tighter and more advanced. Some partnerships might be still at the initial stage, and I think that's okay. I think what's more important is despite the labeling like Global South or ASEAN, these labelings are important to kind of bring the policy conversations forward. But I think what's important is really take into account that these are individual governments that are facing individual domestic politics. So paying attention to uh, each, where each country wants to head, what each country wants in th this partnership, and tailoring what we can give um, to particular countries' needs. I think is the most important part about this global competition. It's actually a lot more individual based, a lot more nuanced aspect of partnership building that United States and Japan are quite particularly skilled at. Uh, so I think we should continue to build on our strength and, um, and therefore sometimes bifurcation, bifurcation between democracy and autocracies might not be always helpful because these countries are different. And I think these countries should deserve recognition that each, each government is different, facing different needs. Uh, but I think US and Japan should um, kind of cooperate and discuss and coordinate these efforts to give what each country wants in these frameworks. Yeah, great, thank you, Ayumi. Terrific lay down. Um, uh, we had a, a, a fair amount of discussion yesterday about um, priorities and resources. Uh, in terms of our ability to execute our respective strategies. And Ambassador Sasai, if I could ask you, you played a really pivotal role in advising the Prime Minister as chairman of the advisory panel in the run-up to the release of the, of the defense strategy, or of the national security strategy. Um, uh, and I, I think it's fair to say that um, Japan has given itself a lot of homework uh, a lot of priorities identified in the national security and defense strategies. Um, there's a human resources dimension to this, right? Trying to accomplish these objectives in a, in a context of, of demographic challenges in Japan. Um, and so even in the context of increased budgets, uh, it won't be easy to accomplish all that Japan has set out for itself. Um, I, I wonder how, how do you think about this question of, of of resources and sustainability in the strategy that Japan has announced? Well, <clears throat> during the course of discussion in this uh, advisory group, uh, you know, there was much emphasis by the participant on the necessity of mobilizing not only the budget resources available to us, that is continue to be an important matter to address how you would allocate the, for the defense, but also there was much discussion that uh, we, that need to be going parallel with the effort to uh, uh, strengthen the economic and social vitality. Because the, at the end, uh, this is a uh, you know, uh, long overhaul. I mean, this effort to uh, increase the defense and the security uh, of, uh, of the nations have to go in parallel with all this social and economic policy. And so uh, uh, this increased doubling uh, defense budget is one thing, but in terms of a total government spending of the sort, it's not as big as we see some other countries around us. So, uh, uh, you know, people think that doubling uh, our defense effort is a big deal, of course, compared to what we have been doing over the years. But in comparative terms, in the global uh, terms, I mean, global standard, I would say. And I think many other countries around the world are doing more than what 
we even envisage in the coming mm. years and so forth. And having said it, I think I agree with you, Chris, on the importance of uh, not only buying a military asset or developing a military asset, including a you know, counter strike capability and so forth, that's one thing. But a more important thing is uh, we have to make our defense force be ready uh, to fight. And I think uh, over the course of the discussion taking place, we realize that uh, we are not really prepared to, for the contingency, I mean, uh, even the uh, sustainability uh, of the capacity to, to fight I mean, ammunition and support. I mean, look at what's uh, happening in Ukraine. And uh, countries are worried about the lack of ammunition. So even Russia today are facing with that problem. So looking at all this one, I think uh, uh, initial phase of our defense effort has to be focused on how we would meet uh, the demand of the immediate demand uh, to, to be faced with the contingency. I think there was much debate yesterday on the Taiwan contingency. I mean, uh, uh, whether that will be really happening or not, that's uh, debatable, but uh, the important part of the, our debate was we had to prepare for the contingency. And that would require not only uh, you know, defense spending and prepare uh, for, uh, for, for, for the contingency in terms of capacity building, but also the uh, mindset of the people. I mean, in, and on top of the training and deployment, so forth. And when we talk about mindset of the people, it's not uh, simply uh, the public at large. That also includes the government, I would say. We ha are we adapting uh, to the contingency if that would be happening? So uh, that is not necessarily the budget resource allocation issues. It's more a matter of how we would face mm. the issues. And that will require enormous effort and energy in terms of a priority agenda. And that would also require our effort to convince uh, the uh, people in Okinawa, for example, as uh, we see more of the deployment and uh, forces and prepare uh, for the future uh, contingency in the region. I think we need to have more understanding uh, from the local community. That, I think that's one of the issues the uh, uh, foreign minister was addressing in his opening statement. And that would be, require uh, enormous political, I would say, energy and input. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that it's not simply the money and budget allocation issues. It's more about how you would allocate your political energy mm. and to get our uh, defense and security apparatus ready for the future contingencies. Yeah, no, I think that's well said that this idea that there's a mindset change that goes with the, the, the reforms that Japan has announced. I mean, one of the comments that came out yesterday, uh, someone noted that the, the shift in Japan from a mindset that war, the post-war mindset that war was something that Japan caused in the past and therefore self-restraint was necessary to a context in which war could come from outside Japan and the lessons of Ukraine and the mindset that uh, change that that imposes. Uh, uh, very interesting. Um, let me, uh, Maria, turn to you. Um, uh, you know, when Prime Minister Kishida was in India, he set out um, sort of a revised concept for a free and open Indo-Pacific, plans for vastly expanded uh, investment resources in things like infrastructure development in the region. Uh, and so on. In, in your remarks, you talked about how um, uh, there's a bit of an unfortunate combination in the United States right now when it comes to economic policy. On the one hand, this focus on risk mitigation, new tools of economic statecraft, but at the same time, uh, an inability to offer things like market access, pulling out of CPTPP, et cetera. Um, how do you think about opportunities in the current context of American politics for deeper cooperation on positive side and the affirmative side um, in, the, in, the, in the global south, for lack of a better term. How can the United States and Japan work more effectively in this, in this space? Thank you, Chris. That, that's a, a tough one, I would say. Uh, let me break it in uh, uh, different uh, components. One, I think it's really uh, important what has just transpired and the fact that uh, Prime Minister Kishida is now 
putting his own uh, spin or his imprint into this free and open in the Pacific strategy that has really been very successful for Japan. It has become uh, Japan's grand strategy, if you will. It's really a, a signal uh, diplomatic initiative. And uh, why the need to do this? I think that, first of all, uh, if you read through the speech, some things uh, really jump at you. First of all, something that the ambassador also referred to, this shock and awareness that when you had this major um, aggression from Russia on Ukraine, in fact, in the developing world, there was not a unanimous view that they should be condemned. And therefore, I think that what Japan is doing is doubling down on what has worked before, that is its connectivity strategy, but now uh, to expand it to a broader set of developing countries and try to uh, make the case that there's a basic understanding of fundamental principles, rule of law, uh, respect for uh, borders, not using force to uh, change the status quo, that should be universal. So I think that Japan is actually stepping up in its level of ambition with this new uh, strategy. I think very importantly that this is announced in India. India has always been a key partner for Japan, a key element of Japan's uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, both in uh, uh, the FOIP but also on the Quad. But now India as the leader of the Global South therefore becomes that a very important bridge towards this set of uh, developing countries. And now not just infrastructure but bringing practical solutions to many of the issues that the developing world cares the most about, debt sustainability, climate change, and so forth. So uh, I have some quibbles or some questions about this in the sense that uh, and something I shared yesterday, and I'll now put it on the record, um, the Global South label itself. Uh, it is uh, trying to cover a lot of very different set of countries in the developing world, and that may not be the most compelling way to tell them, I'm listening to you, I care about your own specific uh, issues. So that's something that needs to be worked out. $75 billion in infrastructure assistance, very welcome, but if you're going to spread it so widely, will they make uh, a difference? So um, in, in, put, in laying this out, I think I begin to see some areas where Japan and the United States can work together on uh, an international economic agenda. Um, and certainly climate change and the Biden administration's now real focus on climate uh, is very important. Debt sustainability, I think it's another issue where uh, both countries can, uh, uh, energy security, all those issues. The one issue where I still unfortunately do not see a lot of uh, prospects for is in the more traditional but very important uh, trade agenda. And uh, you know, the fact that the, um, uh, you know, when we hear some uh, people say in the United States that free trade agreements are outdated tools, I don't think they're reading the region correctly. I think that in the region you have seen the emergence of two mega trade agreements in the past few years. So it means that they care deeply about this. And if we, uh, uh, I think we should, we should be playing a better game if I may say so. We should keep China guessing. When we say we're not interested in the CPTPP, then China has no reason to sweat about us potentially coming back. So I think it would be better if we leave the options open. And I actually see, Chris, maybe I'm wrong and maybe I shouldn't be saying it's something that will live on forever in YouTube, but um, I should say that maybe we need to let the IPEF process work out. There's some good elements of IPEF, but if it's just um, a broad agreement of high level principles where there's no enforcement mechanism, that may be difficult for this to live a very long life. But uh, we need to let this process work itself out and then maybe we'll see that perhaps we do need to go back to the fundamentals of we put market access, we put a long-standing uh, commitment and then the, the region can come uh, 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 and be more aligned with us. And I, I still, we, I don't think we're there yet, mm. uh, but I'm, I think it's a process. Yeah, and certainly there are those who think that IPEF is perhaps the first step in the path back to CPTPP for the United States, so um, hopefully that's true. Uh, Ayumi, let me ask you a final question and then we'll open it up to the floor. And this relates to domestic politics in both countries. I wonder um, uh, to what extent you think both political systems, both publics have absorbed the implications of Japan's new national security strategy and national defense strategy, by which I mean the implications for the alliance, uh, by which I mean um, for the United States, right, the prospect of a Japan that is truly a more equal military partner, 
right? Strengthening that leg of the, of the stool uh, in our relationship. Um, and what that implies in terms of things like the future of host nation support. Do, do the traditional alliance bargains still make sense? Is that, um, is that something that is beginning to sink in here? On the, on the Japan side, I, I think too, uh, has the public absorbed the implications of the path that Japan has now embarked on? As I look at it, for example, the ambassador referenced command and control, the prospect of a Japanese counter-strike capability that relies heavily on U.S. intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities, targeting capabilities, damage assessment capabilities, that invites, requires a much more integrated alliance construct than we've, than we've had than we've had uh, to date. Um, and so, uh, and then in addition to that, um, you know, the reality I think too is that some of these capabilities at least blur, if not change, the fundamental alliance division of labor, sword versus shield. Uh, and I wonder if, if the Japanese public has, has, is beginning to process that as well. How do you think about that? The domestic politics of all this, about the implications for our alliance relationship of the path that Japan has embarked upon. Thank you so much. I think this is an incredibly important point. I think Japanese public has been less ideological uh, compared to during the Cold War. Uh, there's very weak opposition party. I think the public is pretty pragmatic and realistic about the environment that they, the country faces. So I think they are ready to really talk about the future of US-Japan alliance and what that means for them. Uh, however, the conversations about really fundamental change to the role, roles and missions within the alliance hasn't been discussed at the public level. Perhaps some experts are starting to discuss this. Um, but I am optimistic that Japanese public would understand if there are logics being explained carefully, judiciously, and, and, and then leaders would explain to them that this matters with um, certain persuasiveness. Um, but I, I also know that Japanese public are watching U.S. Po domestic politics cl closely and sort of the, how divided the U.S. domestic publics are about sort of the nation, national identity, even including foreign policy attitudes. Perhaps uh, there's a more cohesion on the China questions, but even how to approach US-China competition uh, with allies, how to work with allies to pursue that US-China competition might be different depending on who's in government in Washington. So that information is already out there. Japanese public is watching. So the question about, um, potentially having a joint command and control system, how does that, what does that look like when you have president being elected by different, by American citizens, that might not be something that the Japanese public has really thought about really well. Um, how does it work if there are two um, leaders, heads of, heads of state, really trying to make a decision on combat operations in a war? Um, that hasn't been discussed yet, but these are something that's ahead, and I think the Japanese public is pretty realistic and pragmatic. So I think that these discussions should be carried out, and experts should be going out there and educate Japanese public about this. Great, thanks. Okay, we'll open it up to questions from the floor. We'll have a microphone that gets circulated. Um, please identify yourself and keep your question concise. And we'll start here with Ben Self. Thanks for identifying me. I'm Ben Self with Maureen and Mike Mansfield Foundation. <laughs> I'm going to start by congratulating JAYA and CSIS on a wonderful event today and 29 years of success and four absolutely wonderful, uh, insightful sets of comments. I'm so impressed. So it's a little ironic that my question is, I'm worried about the capacity in our two countries to expand the cooperation to the degree that the directions indicate we're going. Within the government, uh, Mansfield Foundation trains 10 government officials a year to work better with the Japanese. That's a drop in the bucket of the oncoming need. And in the private sector, as much comp cooperation as there is, do we have the talent to bring together for advanced research, for 
development of new technologies in a collaborative way between the US and Japan. The two systems, the two cultures, the languages are very different and we need people like the people in this room, but there aren't enough people in this room to achieve that. So what are your thoughts about developing the capacity to strengthen the cooperation to deliver the uh, results for global public goods? Thank you so much. Yeah, rebuilding people-to-people -people ties was one of our themes of yesterday. Ambassador, would you like to start on that? Yeah, I, I think uh, that's a question we always ask these days. You know, uh, uh, for example, if you look at the uh, students uh, coming to the United States, this has been uh, you know, talked a lot for many years. Even during the time while I was here as ambassador, how could we do it? Increase the capacity? Should we increase the budget for that? Or should we uh, encourage young uh, generations uh, uh, to be more you know, uh, outward looking and not necessarily complacent with the current style of life and, and many things. But uh, when it comes to uh, the will of the uh, government and uh, people, I think there is a good condition, especially after uh, this uh, what uh, COVID is more or less under control and uh, we are moving ahead and people come and go more often. I think if when you, you look at the younger generation, especially Japanese, I would say, uh, there are more city to city. I mean, local universities and local schools are looking toward outside Japan and including the United States. And they are sending t uh, more younger people to the local city in the United States. I mean, that's a good sign. And, but when it comes to uh, technology, R&D, defense, and all this uh, you know, exchange of the people, I think, of course, that there is uh, issues uh, of a budget. And I think uh, there was agreement that the government is going to step up all these R&D uh, technology exchanges, uh, you know, uh, including the METIS program to send uh, all these, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, technicians studying in the United States about, uh, you know, high tech uh, and, and, uh, and starting up uh, new ventures and so forth. And uh, these are uh, fragmented one way or another. But uh, if you look at as a total, I mean, this uh, grassroots effort uh, to be undertaken uh, continue to be an important element of bilateral exercise. So do we have the capacity? Uh, yes, we do. But I think the important thing is uh, the, depending on the individual sectors, I think each, each, each one of them has to uh, work closely with their own counterpart. One of the things, uh, for example, I think important is that uh, all the sister to city relationship and uh, not only Mansfield Foundation is doing great. I know it. I mean, you have sent uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, experts, including the government, uh, to place uh, in Japanese government, and even the JIA. I mean, there are some people coming. I mean, so all this effort uh, putting together uh, is making impact, and uh, especially, and uh, military people. I mean, coming to Japan, and not only interested about uh, manga and comics and. Uh, all these young officers, you know, volunteered uh, to come to work uh, in, in, in the military in Japan. And I asked them, why are you interested in coming to Japan? They say that they are interested in comics. I mean, that's great to see. I mean, all this cultural stuff does matter. I mean, so uh, and I, I'm not that pessimistic about that aspect as we move on. But the important point is, of, of course, the government need to work on uh, more of the budget. Budget resource priority, you said it. I think, of course, we need to do more on the defense. But at the same time, we need to pay more attention to the requirement of the scientists and younger generation and to move forward. And uh, when it's, it comes to defense, uh, you know, technology uh, collaborations, I think the, uh, the new things about uh, the Japanese defense strategy is to work more closely with the United States including uh, introductions of uh, a collaborating system, uh, not only among the government agencies and uh, between the defense agencies, other science-related agency, but also more collaboration with the uh, industries and academics uh, matching up 
all these uh, you know, needs uh, for the future you know, defense technology. That's something new development taking place in Japan. I think there are a lot of things that we need to learn from the United States, you know, DARPA and other systems in place in the United States. So uh, all these exchanges on the technology front is, is very much uh, up front now. Ayumi, would you like to come in on this or? Just, just very briefly, um, and I would say I'm, I'm worried as you are about the pipeline, about the next uh, generation. And I think that one of the themes we discussed yesterday is that the U.S.-Japan alliance had been very, has been very robust, but also had been very conceptual. And now we're going to the implementation level, and we're going to need more human resources to make that happen, but also take into account what I was describing, and that's expansion of the agenda. So more fields are now central. So it's not just about having excellent capability in the you know, scholars of international relations, security experts, defense, uh, but also now scientists, for example, and all these other fields that are going to be uh, of growing importance. I also believe this is a very important time because uh, we've just gone through um, the hardship of COVID and I think that uh, Japan had very restrictive measures for it during the COVID on the arrival of students and I see this as a very important time for Japan to make a big push in uh, attracting uh, students uh, coming uh, again to Japan. But also in the United States we have our homework to do. I worry that U.S. academia has not um, prioritized enough area studies is an old right, but it's a very important one. If we don't have that pipeline uh, of students, then we're not going to be able to uh, then make sure that the, the talent is there to navigate this very important uh, relationship. I see a role for the private sector as well. Paid internships would make a big difference. And the, the most important element I would say is that you really require, um, it's, it's a very heavy investment in uh, the human capital of the alliance because you do require people to spend significant amount of time in the other country. Every meeting I go, every workshop roundtable, when you see the people that care about the U.S.-Japan relationship, usually they have transformative experiences from their youth where they traveled, lived, um, worked in the other country, and then they become lifelong advocates for seeing that partnership continue. So uh, uh, again, it's, it's uh, uh, resources, but across the board, and I think that there's so much that could be done on this front. Next question, yeah, from over here. Well, thanks so much. Uh, this is very uh, informative discussion. Uh, my name is Ken Skabe uh, from Marbury Corporation. So my question is, uh, I want to ask about the uh, uh, economic cooperation uh, relationship with Taiwan. So uh, this year, U.S. is a, a host country of APEC, uh, which uh, Taiwan is the world member. And also, uh, Taiwan is a, uh, the U.S. has a, now having a discussion with uh, Taiwan about the U.S.-Taiwan uh, 21st century uh, uh, initiative of 21st century trade. And uh, uh, Japan is uh, uh, the one of the leading uh, countries in CPTPP, where uh, Taiwan uh, has uh, submitted uh, it, its application. So uh, with that, I want to ask uh, Mr. Sasai, so do you think uh, Japan, Japanese government should uh, strengthen the economic uh, cooperation with Taiwan? And uh, also, I want to ask, uh, uh, Mira, about uh, um, so so this year uh, having a lot of uh, events and also uh, next year Taiwan has a election and the uh, US also has an election. So uh, do you expect uh, any uh, development development uh, in terms of the uh, economic cooperation with Taiwan? Uh, for example, so development in the this uh, U.S. Taiwan initiative or uh, CPTPP uh, process. Thank you. Pastor, sir. <coughs> Thank you very much uh, <coughs> for <coughs> raising this question, how we could support uh, Taiwan, especially in the economic uh, dimensions. Uh, first of all, let me say this, uh, you know, uh, Taiwan is very important in terms of uh, regional security and peace, uh, especially when we see uh, Chinese ambitions, uh, you know, evolving. And, and, but at the same time, 
We need to see the status quo to be maintained. You know it. We don't want to see uh, China would uh, attack Taiwan and, and, and wage a war. No, we want to see Taiwan going for the independence and inviting the, uh, all this uh, use of the force by Chinese. So the best thing is for us to maintain the status quo. And in doing that, what could, could we do? One, we need to make sure that the Taiwan is not isolated diplomatically. You know that uh, China is uh, uh, you know, go, going after one country or another. I mean, uh, asking uh, those countries having a diplomatic relation with Taiwan cut the relationship. I mean, that's pretty bad. I mean, uh, we continue to support Taiwan, therefore, to keep the, uh, all these diplomatic relations going forward. And also expanding its, uh, its political space when it comes to international you know, uh, institutions like WHO and, and other places. And uh, APEC is one place you just said it. I mean, uh, Taiwan is a very important economy, uh, important participant. And not only the participant to WTO, but also participant to APEC. So there is no reason for us not to recognize Taiwan is a very important independent economy, I would say. So that would lead to the second question, what could we do bilaterally with Taiwan? My personal uh, <clears throat> idea, I have been talking about this for some time, but this is not a government policy yet. Uh, since uh, the, the Taiwan's, uh, you know, uh, wish for participating uh, this uh, TPP uh, is a still difficult agenda in terms of Chinese, uh, you, know, uh, you know, issues. And it's not simply China, China is against it. It's, it's in the combinations of uh, a strategic implication of Taiwan uh, being a part of uh, uh, this TPP. Uh, and uh, how do we do with China? Uh, do we exclude China? Then what about the United States? Uh, without the United States, you know, there is a big question mark uh, for Chinese participation. And also possibly uh, Taiwan could have the problem in that context too. So my suggestion is we go for more bilateral with Taiwan when it comes to the economic arrangement. I, I know that the United States is uh, backing up Taiwan, not only in defense and military terms, but also bilateral uh, trade and economic component. So in the same way, my, uh, my suggestion is we go for bilateral with Taiwan. Uh, why not bilateral economic arrangement going beyond the current uh, you know, s sector specific arrangement? And uh, it's a good idea for us to have a bilateral FTA with Taiwan. Uh, I will stop here, and possibly Muriel would have some other ideas too. Great. Well, Muriel. no, those are great, great news. Uh, th thank you, Ambassador. No, no, don't mistake me. I'm not a government uh, no, official. Know. I'm not <laughs> stating that as a government person. I'm rather, uh, you know, saying that uh, as an individual. Yes, no, great assessment, I should say. I uh, very much agree with that. Um, Thank you, abe for bringing the Taiwan question. Um, you know, I think that Taiwan, as a vibrant uh, democracy, uh, faces a really difficult challenge with the growing Chinese uh, coercion, and therefore the marginalization from uh, the region has always been a big, big concern. And, um, you know, the United States uh, has engaged in a, a trade negotiation with uh, Taiwan that I believe is making uh, some very good progress, and, and that's good uh, to see, and therefore, if uh, someone were to follow an Ambassador Sasai's recommendation on the Japan side, I think that there is a potential uh, there. I think that the, the more difficult question is, uh, well, two. One is, um, while we emphasize the importance of, of Taiwan, there's also, I think, some concern in Taiwan where they hear, again, on the economic security agenda, the discussions in the United States, you see the supply chain uh, report that the Biden administration produced. One of the items they highlighted is the risk of concentration of the most advanced chips in the island of Taiwan. And therefore, there's been all this attempt to try to bring TSMC to produce here. And I think that creates some, understandably, uh, uh, discomfort in Taiwan because they, they feel that, uh, you know, if you're referring to us as, you know, a risk that depending too much on us is a risk, I think that creates some uh, discomfort. That's something that needs to be uh, addressed, I think, in the U.S.-Taiwan uh, uh, conversation. 
The broader issue on the, the regional uh, approach to Taiwan, again, I think we should make a good use of APEC. I think that that's one of the key advantages that APEC has over other possibilities, and therefore that we can advance on a regional uh, agenda there with uh, Taiwan as an existing uh, member. On the uh, CPTPP discussion and Japan's desire to join uh, the CPTPP, uh, I think it's a very difficult uh, proposition. It not, has nothing to do with, I think, uh, Taiwan's ability to meet the standards. I think that the Taiwanese government has already done a very thorough job on examining what would be the requirements and making sure that they're up to, um, they, they can comply with those. But it certainly has to do with the sensitivities that this creates among other uh, of the CPT members and the reluctance because they are concerned with a very negative China's reaction, which would be sure uh, to come. Uh, I've heard some experts discuss the possibility of going back to the WTO formula where you had the sequencing and uh, China coming first, uh, but with the understanding that that would then open the door for Taiwan to come uh, next. Uh, but 20 years have happened and a lot uh, has changed and I don't see that as being a more uh, a viable formula anymore. Um, uh, and I think that uh, China would very much oppose uh, 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 Taiwan's uh, membership. So um, my, my, my own thought about this is that it's very important uh, um, that when uh, Japan is a very uh, central country to the CPTPP, but also the other members, when they think about the Chinese uh, bid for accession, that again, uh, a very resolute line uh, that the standards of the CPTPP, which really define the spirit, the vision, the ambition of the agreement are not compromised in, uh, uh, in undertaking that uh, discussion. I, I wanted to bring you in, in on this as well. I think just echoing what two speakers have said, I think this is another reason why U.S. presence in CPTPP matters. I think the fact that U.S. is no longer there, um, U.S. was usually the one who's flagging, uh, kind of showing the flag and sort of allowing other members to feel more comfortable for Taiwan to join such international fora. So the sequencing of having China membership first and then Taiwan is important, but also having US in would also allow it, make it easier for that process. Uh, the other um, area that I'm looking forward to seeing more is the cyber cooperation. I think cyber is uh, you know, very much over, over um, sort of uh, comprehensive area that includes economic cooperation. So as an extension of economic cooperation, I would like to see more cyber cooperation between Taiwan and Japan. Yeah, one of the, the other things we talked about yesterday was um, whether Japan ought to think about strengthening links to Taiwan in the security space more broadly as well. Um, so that's another theme uh, worth revisiting. Let me take one more question and then I'll invite our panelists to offer final remarks. Okay, well maybe we'll, we'll go right to final remarks then. Great. Uh, good morning, my name is Takuo Sato from a Subaru Corporation. Uh, thank you, Mira-san, for the, your introductory remarks. It really catches the, the private sector's concern, and thank you so much. I hope the many U.S. policymakers share your idea on that. Um, particularly on our automobile sector, um, the last year uh, Inflation Reduction Act was passed, and um, the, for the idea, we understand the idea um, uh, having more uh, critical mineral coming from um, U.S. and domestic production. But on, on the details, there are some, um, I think there should be some adjustment, uh, like North, um, uh, for the consumer tax credit, they allow only for the uh, North American assembly, uh, assembled uh, vehicles, clean vehicles, but it should be like more like-minded countries uh, made uh, vehicles should, uh, or uh, eligible for the tax credit. and. So um, my question is, um, it seems like from several uh, recent uh, trend is that uh, U.S. sometimes stepping out a, um, a little bit of the international uh, rules like WTO and um, because U.S. and Japan are uh, allies and also understanding uh, withholding the international standards but sometimes we see um, some uh, rules or some laws are 
um, maybe a little bit out. And, and if even though uh, U.S. are saying that you, other allies or other countries can do the same thing, but it's very hard maybe for Japan to, because Japan is all, 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 always try to follow the international rules, the WTO rules, the OECD rules. Um, so I think there's a, some gap within those how we uh, make a policy and, uh, um, and at the ground. But so, uh, my question is how you can fill the gap on, I, I see there's some difference between how we adhere those international uh, rules uh, such as WTO, but uh, how, how we can um, uh, fill that gap so that we can uh, have more uh, alignment on economic securities and other things. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that, that's a great question. Um, I, I do think that the Biden administration has a very genuine desire to work uh, with allies, and that uh, coalition building is, is certainly part of what's happening. So it's not just, you know, a unilateral take on things. And I believe that in that area, there might be very significant difference with the way in which, say, the Trump administration approached many of the economic uh, security uh, topics. Also, I think that it would be fair to say that there's a process in the U.S. in all these things that it's doing, whether it's the IRA or the uh, Chips and Science and Act, and even with the export controls, what we've seen is growing systematization. So it's possible to track uh, what's happening. At the same time, I do believe that there is um, now a more bipartisan skepticism of both China and the WTO, and they're connected. Uh, the idea that the WTO has not been able to discipline uh, China and therefore um, the need for the United States to do something else. Um, I have long uh, lamented the fact that the United States um, continues to have these veto in the appointment of the appellate board members and therefore has uh, uh, neutralized the enforcement arm of the WTO. I think that that does great harm to the uh, ability to apply rules, and that's not in the U.S. interest long term. I also believe that um, it's uh, uh, striking how in the national security tariffs that the Trump administration imposed on aluminum and steel and the uh, WTO finding was that they were not consistent with Article 21, and therefore that uh, uh, obviously they call out uh, that violation and the Biden administration very hard said this is national security and it's not going to be second guess. So those actions do undermine uh, the, the multilateral trading system. So I, I think that we're seeing these very different impulses of an administration that wants process, um, diplomacy, uh, networks, but it's also very critical of the multilateral body. And when it comes to what it believes are essential national security interests, is willing to assert that view at the expense of the uh, uh, process laid out in the WTO. Um, and I think this is the reality uh, we live in. And uh, you know, it would be interesting to see how this creates frictions, say the Europeans adopt domestic content on, on some of their own uh, uh, um, green energy measures, for example. How would the US react? I think this is a new normal. And we have to uh, fasten our seatbelts. Thanks, Mireya. New normal. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, please, yeah, Ambassador. Yeah, uh, about this new normal. I mean, you know, many years back, back in 1980s, in Japan was criticized for its industrial policy. You know, government is too much intervening into uh, growing the industry, including high tech and so forth. Now the United States is leading all this industrial policy to protect no, not only its security interests, but also, to some extent, even uh, industrial interests of the sort. So could we define this as the ego of big country or the uh, exceptionalism of big country? There could be some debate. But as you said, it, this is a fact of life because the time is changing, new reality of the security environment. So I'm not going to criticize what the United States is doing these days, but the point here is that uh, there has to be some balance between what you think about your own security and also what should be the economic, legitimate economic and trade interests and rules. 
And that trade rule part, the United States continue to be a bad boy. That's my, my, my thinking. Yeah, when I was in graduate school, right, industrial policy was a dirty word, and it was something that other countries did. Um, so it's, it's interesting how we've evolved. And, it, and as you sort of framed up front, uh, Mireya, this, the, this boundary between risk mitigation, competition, and events is really, I think, the issue of the future. Um, I think we're, we've come to the end of our time. I want to invite each of our panelists to offer a couple of um, final remarks. Feel free to diagnose and predict the baseball game if, that, if you're so inclined. <laughs> Why don't we go in reverse order as we wrap up and start with um, Ayumi. I know Japan's going to win the baseball game. <laughs> I can't predict a score, but uh, I'm very hopeful. Um, I think one, one last thing I should really emphasize is this no, normalization relationship with, um, between Japan and ROK and the potential that it might bring to Indo-Pacific. I think there's you know, still grievances among, between each other. There's uncertainty about the durability of this positive uh, momentum between ROK and Japan. But Korea is still a really advanced economy, has a lot of power that can bring if it's interested in contributing more to Indo-Pacific. So because we have so much work to do uh, in the region, I think Japan and ROK, Australia, United States, India, we all have to do our best to bring the resources and then work together uh, to provide what the region needs, compete, provide better infrastructure, and those things all, all at once. Uh, so I'm very hopeful, and I think we have a lot of homework, but I'm, I think we have a right direction that we are heading. Thank you. In my last uh, comments, what I would remark on, I think it's striking that we're in this era of great power competition, really hard-edged uh, rivalry, but also a golden era for diplomacy. I mean, if you think about it, uh, just the Prime Minister Kishida had meetings with President Yoon, with the German leader, with uh, uh, Modi, and now he is in uh, Ukraine, and uh, Biden is also very much uh, building this uh, coalition. So I think it's uh, interesting to see those two elements coexisting. And my last remark would be that this then generates the uh, proliferation of bilaterals, trilaterals, quadrilaterals, and so forth. And there might be a lot of good that comes of this, but also uh, we should not disregard the value of the multilateral organizations like the WTO. And we should be uh, thinking about uh, not wasting too much effort on uh, just many, many small initiatives for trying to aggregate them. Uh, and I think economic security, for example, there should be more dedicated effort to make sure that the transatlantic and the transpacific efforts are working in unison so we don't end up with idiosyncratic uh, rules or stovepipes. And therefore, I think that's the homework I see for going forward. Ambassador? I think as we move on, we will be having more difficult words, world, I would say. Mm -hmm. I don't say necessarily dark, but uh, we have to prepare. And uh, that would require uh, the whole uh, government, the uh, whole nation approach uh, in terms of managing alliance. And uh, that would be involving diplomatic, security, economic, and people to people. And uh, the current status of alliance is pretty much upbeat and strong. I think what we need to do is to make that basic strength of alliance uh, to be a more specific strategy and tactics uh, to cope with the individual sector of the challenges, whether that is Ukraine, China, North Korea, or network in the region, or getting more support from Global South, tailored. And, uh, uh, each sector has its own sort of priority and, and agenda. But what we need to do is that we look at the whole, whole issues as one package. Uh, that's what we, we need to do. We need to have more coordination on the global and regional strategies in place. And uh, that's what we can do, and I'm very much optimistic about the ability for both countries to do that together. Because I, I think our relationship has a pretty strong bipartisan uh, <coughs> support. And uh, moreover, 
70 years uh, we have developed this partnership. This is no small thing. And so uh, for that, I'm, I'm pretty much optimistic in, in spite of some of the divide uh, inside the United States and also some of the uh, politics uh, going on in Japan. Uh, basic status of our, our state is good. So we should be confident of our ability to deliver. That's great. A positive note to, to end on, and certainly agree that uh, it, it has been very much on display here, the, the, uh, the intersection, really, of economics, politics, security, and people to people, uh, and the need for a whole package approach. Well, this has been terrific. Thanks to all of you. Please join me in a round of applause for Ambassador Sasai, Dr. Sobeys. Thank you for 